Hello everyone. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, agricultural science and agri-commerce, um, sometimes called agri-business, so two um, related degree options at Massey. Later on you'll hear about other options in the primary industries such as horticulture and animal science. And so agriculture science, it's what Massey is well known for and there's a lot of careers out there. I've got two examples up here, um, Kate and James, both relatively recent graduates from either ag science or agri-commerce. Uh, Kate's a trainee um, with um, Dairy NZ. Uh, in fact, I think she's actually a full-blown consultant now, but so she's gone through a training program with Dairy NZ after doing her degree at Massey. Uh, James is in the graduate program for Fonterra uh, and sort of probably heading to a bit more of an executive career, but he um, is maintaining a um, farm as well. Uh, and some of you might recognise James because he was uh, the youngest ever winner of the um, New Zealand Young Farmer of the Year um, last year. So he's the current um, holder of that. <clears throat> so why do a Bachelor of Agriculture Science or Bachelor of um, Agri-Commerce or Agri-Business at Mass? Everyone says they're the best, but Massey is actually the top ranked New Zealand university in agriculture. That means we rank higher than the other ones. Um, we're ranked 29th in the world in agriculture. World's a big place um, to be in the top 50 is a pretty extraordinary result for a university that's um, in a relatively small country. Uh, so it gives you an indication that Massey's long history and strength in agriculture has worked through um, over many years to having that sort of world leading position. Uh, as part of that, we offer very comprehensive coverage of food and fibre. So I'm talking about agricultural science and ag, ag commerce here. We cover the whole range. So, you know, everything you'd expect from agricultural economics right through to um, food production. So you've got other options around uh, whatever degree you choose at Massey. In the current uh, environment, many people have been experienced learning um, online teaching or distance teaching. Massey, of course, has taught or offered the option of learning via distance for decades. Agriculture, in fact, has been uh, taught online or via distance as an option for over 20 years at Massey. And so we've got very good resources, very good um, techniques and platforms for doing that. And so just mentioning that as an option, of course, many of you might want the campus experience and hopefully that's, we'll be all back on board with that um, next year. Um, but it's useful to know that the university does offer those other options around being able to be a part-time student or an online student. And if we have the misfortune to have continuing COVID problems, it's not a real issue in doing ag science or ag commerce because you've got that online resource and backup. Of course, we do want you to come to the campus if you can, <clears throat> because we've got superb uh, facilities, we've got all the modern labs that you would expect a university to have. Uh, we've got two dairy farms within walking distance of the university, sheep and beef farms, deer farm, arable area. A centre pivot irrigator used for research, orchards, kiwi fruit, apples, and approximately, I can't remember exactly, but maybe 40 glass houses, I think. And so, and all that's basically walking distance uh, from the university uh, lecture theatre. So we're very well set up to be able to integrate that sort of lab experience <clears throat> in the field and uh, also um, indoors. And just a plug there for the Massey Young Farmers Club. It is the largest club in New Zealand. It's a very successful club. It's the current um, holder of Young Farmer of the Year is from Massey. We're not obviously always going to provide a winner, but what we do provide is that extra experience when you do your degree with us 
where you can mix with a couple of hundred other like-minded people and learn a whole range of other uh, skills as well, which will help you in your uh, career. More specifically, why actually do agriculture or agri-commerce? Well, let's not forget, basically that's what New Zealand really does. We're a world leading premium food and fibre producer, processor and marketer, and people often forget the processor and marketing part. So we, we grow the food, we often manufacture it in some way, and we sell it to the world at a premium. So there's jobs all the way along um, that value chain. There is a lot of jobs out there. Uh, before COVID, there was a job shortage. We were constantly being asked, did we have anyone looking for a job? Um, post COVID, there'll be even more jobs available, I would imagine, because the rural industries have been less affected by the whole lockdown um, than most other industries. But Certainly people coming to New Zealand um, have been um, not able to get here. So a lot of the jobs that were actually taken up by international people because there wasn't enough Kiwis to do those jobs, uh, are currently not able to get into New Zealand. So there's even more jobs than normal. But remember, they, these are jobs that are very much professional jobs or technical um, science jobs, advisory jobs, managerial jobs. These are career jobs for life. So you can do these degrees, of course, and go farming or set up your own farming business. But it's important to understand there's this broad range of professional careers available to you as a result of doing these degrees. And to put that into context, with over, well over 350,000 people in New Zealand actually work in the food and fiber industry. So it's, as it says there, that's one in seven people actually work in the primary industries in New Zealand. The sheer scale that I think sometimes gets forgotten. Um, you know, you watch the news at night, you see a lot of sort of exciting things mentioned as if they're big employers, where the truth is uh, the primary industries are still the big employer in New Zealand. So there's plenty of opportunities out there. And the, one of the reasons why agriculture, agri-commerce have survived and done so well in New Zealand for so long is that it's a top level industry to work on, to work in that constantly uh, adapts and advances. And so occasionally you might hear bad press about the contribution of agriculture to some environmental problems or climate change. What is important to realise is the industry is working hard to fix up any of those issues, and that in itself creates employment for people like you. If you go to our website, uh, you can find out all the detail that you would like about these degrees. So if you put in Bachelor of Agri-Commerce on the Massey website, or just type in Bachelor of Agri-Commerce Massey, you'll get all the details you want about what the course is about, all the individual courses or papers that are in it. And as it says there, there's from next year, there's three major majors or endorsements, farm management, international agribusiness and rural valuation. Similarly, you can go to the Bachelor of Agricultural Science site by just quickly typing it in. It's got a lot of extra information about the degree right down to the details of what's in it. Both these degrees are three-year degrees. Uh, they're very widely um, known and accepted in the industry. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got that option of doing them partly by distance or partly by um, part-time while you're working, if that suits you, or you can come to the campus and do them full-time. Money matters to everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasing thing that these days the government um, pays your fees for you in your first year. But on top of that, we're very fortunate at Massey. We've got a very large um, pool of scholarships available. Uh, for agriculture, agri-commerce students. 
it's a bit of a long um, website there that I've highlighted, but if you type in um, agriculture scholarships uh, at Massey, you'll get to the site easy enough. You'll see there, there's about half a million dollars worth of scholarships available. Uh, so really your chance of getting a scholarship of at least um, a couple of thousand dollars is realistically quite high. So well worth going to have a look at that site. I'll put a few sites below that. Um, I guess to be um, sort of fair-minded. So go horticulture, go daring and careers government. So none of those um, specifically plug Massey. What they all do plug is the fact that there's lots of good careers uh, in all of those areas. So they're just good examples of how the industry um, has come behind um, education in this area and they're all encouraging people uh, to do these degrees and uh, join the workforce. Uh, you'll find profiles of Massey students on all those sites where they talk about uh, how their career has developed after they came to Massey. Okay, so it's an opportunity to answer questions. You can always email me or others at Massey, um, but other than that, what I would encourage you to do is to think, well, if I'm interested in a career in sort of science-related area or economics-related area, and I want to join the biggest business in New Zealand, um, you can do that by doing an agriculture degree, agricultural science, or agri-commerce, or agri-business degree at Massey. Cheers. Awesome, Peter, thank you. Uh, there were no questions in the uh, Q&A, but I did want to uh, kind of prompt a, another question, as I know a lot of our attendees always ask about these scholarships. Um, do you know um, anything about what goes into these scholarships uh, in terms of applying and kind uh, of what yeah. background? Yes, yeah, so if, if you go to that website, um, the forms are all there to apply, so you can do it all, all through that uh, website. In most cases, you just have to say who you are, why you why you, you know, why you're keen on the scholarship. So, what's your background? Um, and in some cases, it matters where you come from. So, there are a few regional scholarships. So, if you have the good fortune to have been born in Northland or Taranaki and Wai or Wairapa, there's three examples of, of regions that actually have specific scholarships you can only get if you come from those regions. Um, but outside of that, it's really as simple as going to the site and filling in a few details, and you can apply for um, multiple scholarships on the one application. Thank you. And just lastly, um, as we as we get this question a lot as well for all um, of those that are interested in the agriculture, um, just around the the practical components of the program. Um, yeah, right. So basically, um, you, you're required to do 20 weeks of um, practical experience um, during your degree or after your degree. Uh, and it, it's, it's two lots of 10 weeks or more. So the way to understand it, I guess, is that between, the, say, the summer holidays between first and second year and the summer holidays between second and third year, you can get a job uh, in some sort of area of agriculture for 10 or more weeks. Um, you, there's an application related to it and you do an assignment um, basically detailing what you've been doing in the job and what you've learnt in the job. Uh, and that contributes to your degree, but also obviously contributes to your um, future employment. Uh, it's important to realise that it's, it's fairly, um, we're fairly generous if you're in a sense of what type of practical work you do. It needs to be useful professional work, but there's no restriction such as you don't have to do a bit of everything. You don't have to do something on a dairy farm and something on a pig farm and something on a deer farm. You can do it um, all in the dairy industry if that suits you. You can mix it around can be on a farm, it can be working for an agribusiness company, um, and in some, some cases a small number of students actually get jobs working at Massey. 
Um, it's, it's for some of you that sounds probably easy. Oh, I know someone. I'll be easy to find a um, a job. But for those of you who think, oh, how would I ever find a job? There's no need to get too concerned uh, because we provide quite a lot of um, advice and um, link people up with positions. We regularly get um, people asking us for summer students and so we put you in touch with them as well. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, our informational evening. My name is Svetla, and I'm a horticultural lecturer at Messi University. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, together with Crystal Hammer, um, an industry representative, to talk about the new Bachelor of Horticultural Science degree. Kia ora everyone, uh, my name is Crystal. Um, I am the Career Progression Manager in the Go Horticulture National Team. So my role is funded by industry and in partnership with Massey University. I'm here to support uh, the, the students coming through the Horticultural Science Programme um, and um, the, the continued development of um, the programme. Um, if we had to look at some of the trends that have been happening around the place, um, we've got a world that is moving towards wanting healthy, plant-based, sustainable food. Um, and so what we've seen is New Zealand's horticulture industry really booming. Um, and so what industry needed to do was to take urgent action to address some of the challenges uh, facing um, facing us as we need to produce uh, more food for more people. Um, in a more sustainable way. Um, and we also needed to make sure that we had the right skilled uh, people coming into the industry uh, to support the work that needed to be done. So the result of this was this new uh, unique degree designed with collaboration um, with key industry uh, partners. And this new degree was launched in 2019. And if we have a look at some of the research that's been done, uh, which supports this, it's telling us that in 2019, uh, the horticulture industry reached a new high, totaling an estimated $9.5 billion. This included $6.2 billion uh, worth of exports, and that number is expected to grow. So by 2025, the horticulture industry is expected to need about 15,000 more workers with qualifications. They've also identified that some of the key growth areas are gonna be in technology, new and emerging markets, and helping industry meet the consumer quality and traceability requirements. So for our students coming through the horticultural science qualification, there are jobs all over the country, but also all over the world. Pass back to you, Svetla. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I'm now going to have a closer look at our degree. Again, this is a three-year uh, three science program that uh, is following more or less the all ag um, agricultural uh, science degree structure. Um, as Peter mentioned, um, Messi University is very well positioned in distance learning, so um, horticultural program is also offered to you as a distance option, but of course you can uh, join uh, the Manawatu campus and uh, take it as internal student. The key feature of uh, this degree is its interdisciplinary approach. Um, the degree combines the science, the technology and the business applied across the whole value chain from the genetics of the, to the final consumer in our domestic or international markets. So whether your interests lie in the ground with soil management and plant production or at the end of the value chain in marketing and supply chain, um, the horticultural science degree will give you the knowledge across the whole of the industry and you will be well prepared for your future career. As Peter mentioned, um, over the summer students are taking uh, practical work, um, which um, you will gain uh, experience in an industry role of your interest. Um, all this is um, 
to give you uh, an advantage with prospective employers um, upon your graduation. Um, and at the end, you will have uh, all the industry contacts and links and a better understanding of uh, the industry as a whole. In addition, um, Messi students have the opportunity to take the student exchange program. Um, this program provides an international experience with a chance to study um, courses at overseas universities and credit them back to Messi qualification. And so basically you pay the same tuition fees uh, while uh, studying abroad and this is a great chance to gain overseas experience and knowledge that many of our employers value here. Uh, some of the top science agricultural universities that we are collaborating with are the University of Calgary in Canada, the Wageningen University in the Netherlands and the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. If you decide to join um, our program um, in, on campus, you will have the chance um, to study in uh, award-winning clubs at um, Manawatu campus and to gain experience in our um, new horticultural facilities, Peter mentioned about the innovation um, apple orchard and kiwi fruit orchards that we have um, in a close walking distance together with uh, the greenhouse complex. Um, finally, if you decide to um, choose our program, uh, it is recommended to have an NCA level two of maths or statistics and also some uh, background in um, biology and chemistry. I will now pass on back to Crystal to tell you a little bit more about the horticultural scholarships and the industry supported horticultural trips. Thanks for that Svetla. Um, so as we can see this whole uh, horticultural science degree is very much industry supported and some examples of that are um, the co-development uh, of the degree from the very, very beginning. Um, and we've seen it in uh, the innovation orchards uh, that are available for use by students as well. And those were developed in partnership with industry. Uh, we also have, as mentioned by Peter, um, a number of scholarships available. Um, an example of some of the scholarships that are available for our students are the five $15,000 Zespri scholarships. Um, there are also many others available on the Go Horticulture website, websites such as Growing NZ um, and also on the Massey websites. On top of scholarships, uh, there are also um, a lot of student um, opportunity to attend large industry conferences, such as the Horticulture New Zealand Conference. Our students also get to go on regular domestic and international field trips, and these are often sponsored by industry as well. So trips uh, such as multi-day trips to the Bay of Plenty or to the Hawke's Bay, where they get to engage with the industry and see um, firsthand what it's all about. Uh, we've also run trips uh, overseas to Europe and Korea, uh, where we've been able to expose students to the the global uh, horticultural industry and give them that kind of experience and learning to bring back and apply to their learning. Thanks, Svetla. Thank you, Crystal. Finally, I'd like to uh, finish our presentation um, by showing you a couple of our recent graduates that we are very proud of. Um, Leander Archer uh, was um, a Messi agricultural top student um, some couple of years ago, and now uh, she's following up her career as a hort science and a business consultant in Ackfurst in Hawke's Bay. Um, the other girl from Hastings uh, is Summer Wynyard. Um, she just graduated last year and she's already part of the uh, team uh, of Apples and Peers in um, Hastings. So because Messi is the only university offering the horticultural science degree currently in New Zealand and due to our close relationship with the industry, our graduates are given a priority in the job market and they really accelerate their careers faster and they have the specific knowledge, the networks and the experience gained throughout the, uh, the degree. 
And most of our students are offered multiple jobs throughout their studies. And if you have decided um, to join the degree, you will have many options to choose from when um, you graduate. So basically, um, if you need some more information, again, visit Messi website about the Hort degree and um, or contact us with some questions. Thank you. Hi, Svetla and Crystal. Sorry, Crystal, I didn't introduce you. Um, we no do worries. have a question. We do have a question uh, that's popped up uh, and it's around practical work. Uh, if you have done uh, practical work already and whether it counts to the degree uh, while you're studying. So pr practical work for the horticultural degree is similar to the agricultural science degree. Um, students are taking um, this work um, during the between the first and the second and the uh, second and third year in the summer uh, break. Um, they can use some uh, of their work experience before coming to the university. Um, and this will be uh, counted as their first um, um, practice um, sort of experience with, within, the, within the industry. Um, Crystal, do you want to add something? No, I think you answered that one quite well. <laughs> yeah, uh, similarly yeah. To, to agriculture um, degree, we, we have a very good connection. Obviously, having Crystal on campus is a great support for all students to find and match their interest with uh, a summer job of, uh, of, uh, of their interest. This, um, this has been working very well uh, last summer um, and um, all the students um, have uh, great feedback from their working experience. Uh, Dr. Tony Mutsukumira, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, and good evening everyone and thank you for attending our science information evening. Um, I would like to say I would like to start by saying that I also want to thank uh, the two presenters before me because they've actually started the uh, the discussion on food. Peter mentioned the food several times. Swatla mentioned food several times and uh, Christio mentioned the food several times. That shows you where we are going. Food is important. Uh, you know, when we talk of food, each time when I'm presenting food to an audience, it's the question I always get is, or my colleagues, or at the universities, why study food technology at Massey? Why, why Massey? That's the question we always get. Right? Before I take you into why study food technology at Massey, I'd like to say to you, my, my three colleagues have done me a good favor by mentioning food. I want to now take you a little bit and you know characterize what they were saying. Food technology is all about integrating all the sciences the engineering, the biology, the chemistry, um, the agribusiness, in fact, because our students also study business in, in food, uh, food technology major, they also do business. We integrate all the sciences to build up the program or the professional or the graduate. And all this is aimed at producing a final product which is safe and high quality, and it's, it's there to feed the world to keep the world going. And that is what food technology is all about. It's an integration of all the sciences. Now, I move on to why Massey? Well, why Massey? Massey is the place where to start food technology. We work with many companies. I'm only showing you what I call just a drop in the ocean of the companies we have in New Zealand. Large and small or large, medium, uh, and small, we all work with all those companies. And what you see those, um, the images or photos you see of those smiling students, they left many years ago. I can tell you that they're still smiling where they are. The reason is those guys are occupying um, prestigious positions. 
and we work with all those companies. And how do we work with those companies? They, at Massey, at, 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 uh, the food technology at Massey has got what we call the advisory uh, group. In this advisory group, we work hand in hand in developing the curricula. We need to develop a curricula which fits into New Zealand society to develop uh, products for not only for domestic sale, for also for international marketing. So we work together to make sure that we produce the skills and the graduates which will do the job in industry to deliver what is required. And some of these companies, I should say, like my colleague said, some of these companies provide scholarships. So if you are intending to study food technology at Massey, there is a number of industry based scholarships which are offered through Massey, but they are also Massey scholarships. So you have a chance of getting something if you apply for a scholarship, particularly those people are starting at part one level. Right. Food technology to extend a little bit. It is all about being creative. We create food products and the processes. And this is what is shown here in the middle here. Really, it is about what happens here. You know, our students are taught to be innovators, innovators of new products, innovators of new processes for food and the number of the products you see in the supermarkets. In one way or another, a food technology from Mercy has been behind some of that innovation, and we are very proud of that. We have what we call in our four year program, which I'll come to a little bit later. We have what we call uh, skills development summer internships. Food technology is a four year degree program, honors degree program, which means you have to do a project at the end. And in the summer, in the second year, when you finish your second year and third year, in the summer, a minimum of 10 weeks, you'll be required to now uh, use the information, theoretical information you have gained at university in industry. And you are recognized by, in fact, they, these are, these are two courses which you are required to do because you are required to do a minimum of 10 weeks in each of those summers, end of the end of second year and end of third year. And we believe that this is this is actually makes this very unique. What we have noticed. What we have noticed is that. Um, uh, what we have noticed over the years is that when some students go out into the summer uh, internships, actually they come back not only with the skills development but also carrying a potential job and that is quite interesting for us you know they also carry a potential job and that is important for their own development now in the four-year program we have at Massey, in the fourth year project in the fourth year uh, in your last year of study with what we call the capstone project and the capstone project is the name says is uh, a project where you'll be working with colleagues developing blue sky pro uh, products and novel products these are funded by Massey, and these projects are designed to really turn you into an innovator an innovative food technologist we challenge you to come up with a product which does not exist on the market, but which is in sync with the current consumer demands. The, fun the so-called functional foods, the, what has been mentioned by Peter or what has been mentioned by Svatla is the naturalness of foods which people are demanding. We challenge you to come up with those products. And this is a capsule project and we'll be doing it for the entire year. And not only just developing a product as a capstone project, you'll be required to develop a product which is marketable and you upscale 
at our, you know, at our facilities, either at Manakau Innovation Football, uh, football in, in uh, near the airport or in Pamaso North. If you're working in, in Auckland, you go down Pamaso North. If you're in Pamaso North, then you've got the pilot plant. We allow you the opportunity to upscale and actually commercialize the product by selling to the consumers. And you want to see that, you know, you bring in a commercial product which is viable in terms of cost economic benefit. I just need to look for my. Uh, oh, sorry, I've lost my case here. <laughs> right. Our teaching staff in the food technology department they are world class teaching staff. A lot of the people we have a lot of experience and this experience has been gained in the classroom, has been gained in research and also a lot of our staff members have got have got industry experience. We don't in our program have what we call teaching assistants as much as teaching assistants are valuable, but they are they don't participate in the teaching. The teaching is left to the experts who we have known. We have been in the game for a while, and that is how we ensure that the quality of our teaching is at a high level. Well, we as some of my colleagues have talked, they are Newcomers on the game, which we value because you know they are part of the food chain. But uh, food technology is proud to uh, inform you that we have more than 50 years of experience in the game. And we have, uh, well, can't say recently, six years ago, we celebrated our fifth year birthday. And that really shows that, you know, we've seen a lot on the food technology landscape. And in terms of the delivery of the program, we have got three uh, three sites. We have uh, the Auckland campus where I am delivering this speech from, and we've got the Mana, 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 Manawatu campus, and we have also an offshore campus, which is Singapore Institute of Technology. And soon we'll be adding another fourth one where we'll be operating with China. And the reason why I should actually indicate why we are operating in Singapore and in China, we are there by demand for our product. The product food technology, our degree program is in demand and therefore it has been in Singapore for quite some time since 2008, where we partner with the Ministry of Education and at the moment we are based at the Singapore, Singapore Institute of Technology and the students studying there, they get the massive degree food technology, honors degree technology, the bachelor of uh, or uh, food technology, the four year program. We teach online uh, staff, our staff go there to teach and that shows uh, the quality of the program we have. Just to talk uh, briefly about the program bachelor of food technology honors degree. It's a four year undergraduate degree program. It has got two majors. We've got the food product technology and we've got the food processing engineering. The difference between these two is in the third year. That's where if you would like to uh, specialize in uh, food product technology, you continue with that line. And if you want to go with the food process uh, engineering, you also take that line in terms of the projects. When you start now to do your projects in the second semester of the third year, that is where we uh, tend now to uh, differ in the two majors in terms of your interest. But in terms of the job market, the two majors are are complementary. A food process engineer can work very well in the food product uh, technology development. And likewise, uh, the person who has taken the food product technology line should also be able to work in the food process engineering. The reason is we offer these uh, the courses uh, in the same way. We only differ a little bit when you start now to specialize in your project. Another aspect we are proud to uh, share with our audience. 
we are approved. A program is our, our program is approved by the Institute of Food Technologies in the United States, and this is important. This is a powerful body which has been in existence for a long time, and also offering food uh, food technology to uh, a number of uh, universities around the world. And another important part we are also proud of is that we are accredited by the Institute of Professional Engineers of New Zealand, the Washington Accord and the Singapore Accords. Having an endorsement by such a in such organizations like IFT or the Institute of Professional Engineers of New Zealand or the Washington Accord or Singapore Accords is important because it demonstrates the product you are offering is of the of high quality. Just briefly to talk about uh, postgraduate academic programs. We have a number of these programs. We've got a uh, Master of Food, Food Safety and Quality, Master of Dairy Science and Technology. Work very closely with Fonterra with that one. We have a graduate diploma in science and technology, and also we do have you know programs which we can offer to PhD level, those people who aspire to the highest qualification uh, at any university, which is the Doctor of Philosophy. It is uh, essentially by research. We are also affiliated to a number of research institutes which are of a national importance in the country. We have a food pilot plant, a food pilot plant which is based in uh, Manawatu campus with the nutritional lab. Uh, it is an accredited lab with what we call Reddit Center of Research Excellence, which is also of a national importance because it doesn't, it's, it's based at Massey, but it is a of a national importance because it works with a number of people around the country. We've got Food HQ is also a national institute, which is also working based at Massey, but is also working uh, with a number of people around the country and also international people are also working with that. We have the New Zealand Food Safety and Science Centre based at Massey, but is also of a national importance. So all these organisations I have mentioned on this slide here, they are based at Massey, but they are working with a number of uh, people around a number of organizations around the country and internationally as well. As Red introduced, uh, my name is Fraser and I am a senior lecturer in engineering at uh, the School of Food and Advanced uh, Technology here in uh, uh, Auckland. I'm also the mechatronics uh, major leader and it's uh, I'm responsible for the mechatronics major which is part of the Bachelor of Engineering uh, offered by uh, Massey University. So today I want to talk to you about uh, engineering. Why do you want to be an engineer? Uh, what sort of opportunities exist for you as an engineer? Uh, our structure of our program and uh, what it is that you'll do while you're here at Massey. Now I'll talk about some of the projects that our students work on and then uh, finish by just showing some examples of what our uh, students have achieved. So why should you become an engineer? Well, I became an engineer because I wanted to make a difference. Uh, when I was at high school, I wanted to be a surgeon and uh, my science teacher said I wasn't too smart. So I thought, um, all right, well, I'll become an engineer. And uh, I found out that uh, I was able to achieve the uh, goals that I originally had as a young man, uh, a student at high school, and that I've been able to make a real difference. So as an academic, it's been in teaching students to help uh, realize their passions and uh, those students have gone out and had a significant impact on society. So that's something I'm really proud of, but you can you can have that same sort of impact. Uh, engineers are paid uh, good salaries. If we look at the uh, former um, institution of professional engineers salary reviews from a couple of years ago, the uh, graduate salary rates were approximately 55,000 for the, the median uh, New Zealand dollars that was and uh, those have only increased uh, in a more recent Engineering New Zealand uh, salary review. We're seeing the entry graduate uh, uh, salary, salary around uh, being around about 60,000. 
uh, companies uh, uh, find New Zealand uh, you know, massive university trained engineers uh, to be attractive and we've seen our graduates being employed in a wide range of uh, companies. For example, Becker, Fisher and Paykel Healthcare, Glidepath, uh, Quoris, uh, Transpower and uh, Compaq. You don't have to just work in New Zealand. Because our degree is accredited against the Washington Accord, you can work not just uh, domestically, but internationally. And so uh, the picture I have down the bottom is uh, an example of one of our, our former colleagues, uh, Andrew, uh, who has gone and actually worked for the, uh, an international engineering organization that works with uh, third uh, world countries to help develop uh, cost effective solutions to, to local problems. So that was uh, Engineers Without Borders. So th the work that you do as an engineer can be quite uh, varied. So whether or not you're interested in programming, in electronics, mechanics, building robots, AI, all of that uh, can be done uh, under an engineering uh, umbrella. So why study engineering at uh, Massey University? Well, I'm a bit biased because I'm a Massey graduate myself, and I think the program that we have uh, is fantastic and uh, it's something that I'm very proud of. But uh, we get a lot of positive feedback from our students and from our industry partners, and uh, it kind of revolves around the fact that we have a unique blend of theory and applied project uh, work. So our degree is uh, split into uh, uh, one quarter of it being project based, and so that's where uh, each uh, semester you're doing at least one project based course uh, alongside three uh, academic courses. So this means that uh, each year, if you're first, second and third year, you're doing two projects, two big projects per uh, year. But in your fourth year, you get to do uh, a capstone project, which is a double semester project uh, where you work with industry to solve some real world problems. And you also do a individual research project where you're trying to come up with a solution to a, a difficult to solve problem that you you can be proposing yourself or uh, an academic could propose and uh, that uh, gives you an opportunity to kind of fine tune your uh, degree. So you get a, a really good uh, blend of theory and project based uh, work. Because of that uh, project spine that we have with all those projects, gives you an opportunity to be really creative and come up with some uh, innovative uh, solutions. And in fact, some of the students who have uh, developed uh, projects through the capstone have gone on and commercialized those, creating their own companies as a result. We have a very good relationship with industry and many of those capstone projects uh, that you would work on in your fourth year are proposed by uh, industry. So for example, uh, over the last couple of years, we worked with train, uh, 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 Transpower to uh, develop a, a remote controlled uh, robot for uh, substation inspection. And so that was a project that originally started off uh, with fourth year engineering students building a, a mobile robot that could be controlled over the internet from Transpower's uh, uh, Wellington sub uh, control station. And that got uh, spun out with the uh, students uh, creating a company and uh, that was a successful um, conversion of a, a project that students started into a company. So, so there's the, the industry is giving us the problems and we're, we're meeting those uh, industry needs and that's giving our students opportunities to be creative and spin out companies. Because of this project uh, spine and the practical nature of our uh, courses, we've getting a, a really good reputation with uh, industry of being our uh, graduates being really capable, uh, applied, hands on and uh, hitting the ground running. So they they know how to be engineers and they, uh, when they go out into the workforce, they don't need to be trained uh, by the companies to kind of do what they need to do. I think one of the advantages that we have of other universities is our smaller class size and it gives us opportunities to get to know you as students and uh, tailor the projects to what you're interested in. You're, you're not a number, you're a name and a person to us, and it makes it um, easy for us to have good relationships with our students. And uh, part of having smaller class sizes is being able to actually interact with you more personally. So if you have a problem, you can come and talk to us. We have open door policies that makes it easy for us to interact. We have a, a number of majors available uh, to us, uh, for you to study. Uh, at Massey University, we've got the uh, mechatronics major, 
it's a uh, practical applied uh, major that combines both mechanics, electronics and software to develop uh, solutions to uh, engineering problems. Another major we have is our electronics and computer engineering major. And this focuses on the electronics and software aspects of uh, developing engineering solutions. The other majors we have are engineering and innovation management, which focuses on the design process and managing of a uh, engineering process. We have also uh, chemical and bioprocessing. However, that uh, major uh, is only offered on our Palmerston North campus. Both mechatronics, electronics and computer engineering and engineering and innovation management are offered on both the uh, Auckland and uh, Palmerston North campuses. Uh, as mentioned uh, by Tony, our uh, program is actually accredited by Engineering New Zealand, formerly the Institute of Professional uh, Engineers New Zealand, and they are a, a national body that uh, checks to see that what we're doing adheres to the Washington Accord. And that says that what we're teaching at Massey University is in line with the other universities and, uh, for example, uh, Auckland, uh, Victoria and uh, Canterbury, and also our uh, international universities in countries like Australia, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, and more recently universities in China. So this accord allows for you to take the qualification that you've received here in New Zealand and travel and work overseas and be recognized as an engineer in that country. As I mentioned, our uh, program is uh, one quarter of it is uh, project based and we can see that uh, on the right hand side column. These are all the sort of projects that you would work on. So in our first year, you have uh, two projects and our second and third year, uh, we've got uh, two projects and then a double semester uh, project in year three. And then in year four, we've got these two uh, big projects. The rest of your courses will uh, differ across each of your majors. Here I've just illustrated the mechatronics majors uh, courses. In the first year, you're learning about the uh, fundamentals of engineering through physics, uh, programming, math, and uh, the projects. And you have an opportunity to do an elective uh, based on your own interests. In the second year, you'll start to learn more about the uh, electronics, uh, CAD, and uh, math. And then in your third and fourth year, that's where you really specialize. So for the mechatronics uh, students, they'll be introduced to more mechanics. And in their fourth year, they're learning about robotics and uh, AI and the mechatronics. They also have an elective where they can choose a course to um, uh, fine tune their fourth year to uh, what they want it to be more uh, specialized about. I'd encourage you to, to check the Massey University website to see each of the uh, course structures for each of the different majors, but they share that common project spine. Currently, our uh, Bachelor of Engineering has the following entry requirements. Uh, if you have 16 credits in math and 16 credits in physics, uh, you can get into a engineering with no uh, issue. Uh, alternatively, if you've done Cambridge or the uh, baccalaureate uh, qualifications, you need uh, A levels or 29 points with the following uh, conditions. I will uh, make a uh, point here of saying that we have actually looked at removing these um, entry requirements. So perhaps closer to the end of the year or beginning of next year, you may find that these uh, entry requirements are removed. So if you don't have uh, math, don't worry. If you don't have physics, don't worry either. As long as you've got um, uh, the, the credits to get into university, then uh, you can enroll in a, uh, a Bachelor of Engineering and that's just leveraging the uh, the entry requirements of our common BSc first year. So as long as you can pass that first year, you can carry on doing engineering. But if uh, for whatever reason you have uh, maybe a unique case, uh, please be aware that we do consider every application individually. So you've got into Massey, uh, you've studied engineering. What sort of projects do you do? Well, here are just some examples of student projects from our uh, first, second and third year. So in the top left hand corner, we have a smokeless oven that was made by students as part of the Engineers uh, Without Borders Challenge. Uh, in the centre here, we've got some CAD models that were designed by students as part of their uh, uh, computer aided design course. Uh, here is a uh, project where students have actually built a coil winding machine that uh, shows um, and using their 
add skills and uh, workshops to build uh, 3D printed laser cut uh, machines to wind uh, copper onto a uh, bob. So that's part of the second year uh, project course. Down here, we've got a robot that a student built as part of the uh, third year um, uh, project course. So many of these projects are group based activities where you're working with fellow students to solve problems. And that's to reflect the, the nature of working in industry. You don't work on your own, you tend to work as a group. Here are some examples of what students have worked on during their uh, fourth year uh, capstone projects in their individual research projects. So uh, on the top row on the left here, we've got a uh, sensor that's used for measuring air quality. This is connected to a modem, and so they get uh, real-time information about the quality of air and, uh, being transmitted over the internet to a server so that uh, companies and organizations like Auckland uh, Council can know how what the quality of the air is. Um, on the right-hand side here, we have a, a remote-controlled uh, net um, uh, machine, uh, which was designed uh, to meet some of the uh, EWI needs, where they wanted to have uh, nets uh, deployed uh, autonomously uh, rather than having uh, people go and do it uh, themselves. We have other examples of uh, robots that have been designed for doing uh, pasture um, measurements and uh, algorithms that were developed uh, to detect uh, patches of um, uh, urea on uh, grass. But all of these combine uh, their uh, majors, uh, disciplines of mechanics, of electronics, software to solve some uh, real problem. So I mentioned uh, that some students have actually gone and commercialized uh, some of their projects. And so here we've got some examples of, uh, this is Tim and uh, Mitchell, and they developed a, a robot for CDAX. Uh, so Tim and Mitchell, they spun out the company uh, along with uh, Hayden and a couple other graduates uh, to develop robots uh, for industry. Here's Hayden, he's just developed uh, here a, an AI system for helping uh, farmers. And uh, here was just a picture of the early prototype that uh, the team had developed for uh, TransPower. Other students like uh, George uh, Hillheim, uh, they he went and developed a, a company named Ready, which uh, provides services for uh, consumer markets, uh, specifically things like cafes, and telling people that their, um, their, say their coffee is ready to be picked up. And it's uh, particularly uh, relevant now in our uh, COVID isolation uh, situation. So hopefully that's given you an idea about our uh, projects. And uh, I'll finish here uh, saying that when we're uh, able to host you, please come and visit us. Uh, you can contact us here uh, via um, our administrator, Diane, and give us a call and look us up on the Massey uh, uh, website. Thanks, Reddy. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Reddy said, a couple of questions have come in about IT and computer science, and that's great. Keep those questions coming in on the Q&A. Um, some of the questions were around campus, so I'll just clarify that before we start off. Um, that uh, uh, the computer science and the other majors to do with information sciences are available particularly at the Albany campus in Auckland, um, but some, some of the majors are available in the Palms of the North campus, and some of the majors are available by distance or online study. Uh, we are looking to have more majors available online in future, but we haven't got there yet, so you need to keep in touch if you're interested in that. Um, okay, so I want to start off looking at the ICT industry. So the ICT industry, uh, around the world has got um, all sorts of uh, jobs available all the time. And the best way to get a feeling for that if you're in New Zealand is to have a look at the SEEK website. So the SEEK website is full of various ads of jobs available in the ICT industry. And it's a very good way to give you a quick snapshot of what's available. And um, one of the things you notice about ICT is it's consistently got far more jobs than any other area uh, available. and um, most of those jobs are for software developers. In fact, the jobs available for software developers are more than many other sectors as a whole, and the, the salaries in ICT are significantly higher. 
So what sort of jobs do they have out there in ICT? They have software developers, software engineers or architects, uh, business systems analysts, testing and quality assurance and program management. Sometimes it gets confusing, uh, all these different terms. And in fact, different companies actually use different terms for the same thing, which makes it even more confusing. Um, but we've got that covered as part of your study at Massey, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so moving on to what we offer in our degree at Massey, that's the Bachelor of Information Sciences, known as the BNSI. We have majors that directly relate to those areas where most of the jobs are available in the global software industry. So we have a software engineering major, a computer science major, an information technology major, information systems, and data science. And as I mentioned, many people are confused about what all these different majors are and which one what and so on. And that's okay because our degree is set up so that you can come along, you can do the first year, and your first year actually sets you up for any one of those majors. So you choose a major when you enroll, but, but by the end of first year, you, you might like to change your major to one of the others. And that's all fine, you can do that. Um, and in fact, many students do that because they realize that they enjoy one particular area. The first year gives you a little taste of each one of the areas. Um, and then you uh, go on in second year to, to do the one that you're most interested in. So let's go through the majors that are available at Massey. Uh, first, we have the information technology major. So the information technology major is just the study of and the impact of IT on the world in general. Having a look at all the various technologies that are available, also having a look at systems analysis and design. Um, and in particular, we cover the topics of database testing, web design, security, user requirements. That's just the, some of them. We cover other things as well. Um, the information technology does not have much software development in it. That's in the computer science uh, major, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, but the informa information technology is a much broader, more general major, um, which many people prefer because they don't want to get too technical and too tied down in one particular area. And that particular area is the computer science major. So the computer science major really focuses on just one thing, and that is computer programming, which is also known as software development. So in the computer programming major and the computer science major, we have a number of topics. An important one, for instance, is algorithms and data structures for part of computer programming all around the world. Um, and then to become a good computer programmer, you have to learn several programming languages. Uh, programming languages that are around today are things like C++ and Java, which we cover. Um, and also Python and other languages. There, there's something like 200 languages available. We certainly don't cover all of them, but we give you a good grounding in the main ones. Uh, and once you know one or two computer languages, it's reasonably easy for you to pick up others. And the computer science major covers various specialist topics such as embedded programming, uh, in other words, programming hardware devices, uh, systems programming, in other words, programming operating systems, things like Windows and so on, mobile applications, programming phones and other small devices. Um, so we have a number of, of branches of computer programming, but really the computer science major is entirely about uh, the skills, the knowledge uh, that you need to have in order to program computer software. So then we get to the software engineering major and the software engineering major is called a joint major. And that's because that's what it is. So it's a combination of the computer science major and the information technology major. Um, this means you have less choice in the software engineering major. You have to pick some of the computer science courses and some of the information technology courses. But then, of course, you're getting more breadth. So it's giving you a really good foundation for a career in designing and maintaining all the complex uh, software applications that we have around today. For those of you interested in careers, um, Usually employers aren't particularly fussy. So our computer science graduates, well, most of the time get the same sort of jobs uh, that a software engineering graduate would get. Uh, and those jobs usually at the beginning involve software development. Uh, then we have our data science major, which is all about data and in particular handling huge volumes of data. That's a problem nowadays is that people want to 
people, for instance, get data from the internet and there's actually just so much data that they don't know what to do with it. So it's all about how to process and transform your data and how to successfully visualize your data, show the data in ways that are meaningful so that people can get something useful out of it and how to extract information from data with data mining. So that's a whole lot of different techniques and algorithms that are available in the data science major. And as I mentioned before, uh, you don't have to, you, you, you enroll with a major, but you don't have to stick with that major. At the end of your first year, um, you can change your major. We know that everyone is unsure of which of the best major is for them. And so that's built into the process uh, of how you, you do your degree at Massey. Uh, one thing I will add about the data science major is you do need to be good at maths. So the data science major has got more maths and more statistics in it uh, than the other majors. And we have the information systems major. So the information systems major is really where we look at IT and business. Um, so it relates to the business side, um, how you would set up your business to use IT successfully, e-commerce, social media, et cetera, um, things like project management. Um, and basically we describe the information systems major as being the human side of computing, whereas um, some people regard computer science as being a more a technical side of computing. Uh, so for those of you who do uh, are technically minded, who maybe have already been involved in a little bit of programming, uh, at our Albany campus in Auckland, that is the only campus in New Zealand, no matter which university you look at, it's the only campus in New Zealand that teaches the programming languages C and C++. And we do that for a reason, because those languages are much faster than other languages, much more efficient than other languages, particularly if you want to do real-time applications. So if you want to write programs that control robots or programs that do games or programs that make movies, then you need to do those in C or C++. Um, we have a games programming minor available at the Albany campus to go with your computer science major. And uh, again, C is, or C++, I call it the C family. So there's a whole lot of languages that have got C in them. There's C, there's C++, Visual C, um, all sorts of things, but they all come down to basically the same language underneath. That's the C language, which you learn in first year, and then you learn C++ as you go up to second and third year. It's, we never only teach one language. You also do courses in Java um, and other languages as well. So the Albany campus in particular has got a very applied and technical focus. So why would you want to study the Bachelor of Information Sciences at Massey? It's the only degree in New Zealand that has all five of the majors that I've just listed in the same degree. Uh, many other universities, for instance, put the information systems major into a business degree, but we've got all the degrees together because they all go together. They're part of the ICT world, if you like. And there's this major advantage where it's easy to change your major after the first year. We are also the only degree in New Zealand that has an IT major at an undergraduate level. Um, and it's an accredited professional degree and it's particularly designed for people who want to go on to have careers uh, in the software industry. Um, so that's just the list of majors again, but um, that's all that I'm saying uh, for this evening. Thank you for listening. Hey, Chris, we do have one question that uh, thought we uh, should share. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, what type of projects and homework uh, do you do in the computer science major? So in the computer science major, when you, first of all, your homework all the way through the major, we give you assignments. So you learn more about programming and then we give you assignments to do at home on programming. But those are pretty, um, pretty constrained. You have to do certain specific things because it's all about progressing your knowledge of programming in certain areas. So for instance, when you learn about arrays, then it will be important to do a program on arrays. Um, but then in third year, we have a big capstone project that every student does uh, to end off their degree. And that project has got quite a lot of different ways of doing it. You can do it by yourself on a project you're interested in, or you can actually be an intern in a business and work with a business, or you can work with a lecturer on campus. So there's a number of different projects available. And certainly we are used to people working on their own at home, if that's what they prefer. Um, so, yeah, a wide variety of things that are available to do both on campus or on your own if you prefer to study in that way. Okay, kia ora all and welcome to Massive Construction Program. My name is James Rotimi and I'm the Academic Dean Construction and my role 
is to ensure that you have the best of experience during your program at Nancy University. Together with my colleagues at the School of Beauty Environment, we have designed curriculum at various levels of delivery to ensure that we have truly international programs that appeal to everyone, regardless of which parts of the world you come from. Our graduate profiles are continuously being updated to ensure that students graduating from our programs are work ready and are able to partake and deliver on exciting projects in any part of the world that they may find employment. So sit back, relax, as I run through a few details about the School of Beauty Environment, one of six academic units under the College of Sciences at Mercy University. Now I've assumed in my presentation that you, you would have gone through information on the Mercy website, but if you haven't, don't worry. This is the essence of this information evening to address some of your queries. As I've previously uh, said, we have a range of qualifications from the graduate certificate in science and technology lighting, the bachelor of construction right through to the highest academic qualification, the doctor of philosophy in construction. For a bachelor of construction, we currently have two majors in quantity surveying and construction management. It is currently a three year degree program covering major aspects of technology, law, cost, and management. We believe these four aspects are cardinal in any construction program and they are what sets us apart from other construction programs that you may have heard about. Now we have plans of introducing a fourth year, so if you come in to join us next year, you will be coming onto a brand new curriculum that includes a fourth year, which is optional. Um, which is an honors year if you are the type that is interested in continuing on to doing a PhD. Now, but for our bachelor's program, um, we currently have two majors in quantity surveying and construction management. Courses in the first one and a half years of the bachelor's program are common to both majors after which each major begin to pursue courses that are unique to either construction management or quantity survey major. In the first two years, courses require weekly attendance of lectures and tutorials, whereas in the third year, delivery is organized in block mode, meaning that within a semester, you would only be required to attend whole day workshops for a few days in each block. Typically, most courses have two blocks of two whole day lectures per semester. Now, this block delivery mode particularly suits a generality of our students who by their third year on the program are already working in industry. There is a requirement of a total of 600 hours of industry work experience, and this is usually broken down into two parts with students undertaking the, their work experience or practicum during the summer break between the first year, their first year and second year, and between the second and the third year, that's when they do the, uh, the balance of the 300 hours um, of industry work experience required of them. Now, the industry work experience is the opportunity that our students take to get their foot into the New Zealand job market, and very often by the time they are in their third year, a significant percentage are already gainfully employed. It will interest you to know that Massey is the only university that offers degree qualifications in um, construction in New Zealand. And in terms of ranking, we are within the top 200 programs offered in universities around the world under the architecture and built environment category. The um, entry requirements, it's just as normal for most degrees, you need a reasonable knowledge of mathematics and you're able to communicate well in English. Uh, general university entrance or you're 20 years old or older. Now for our post um, graduate taught qualifications within the School of Beauty Environment, we offer 
the postgraduate diploma in construction and master of construction. And under these qualifications, there are five different fields of specialization on offer. Building technology, where you learn to design and manage healthy and energy efficient buildings. Construction law, where you gain specialist knowledge in construction law, contracts, project administration, and the management of disputes. Construction project management, where you gain some skills for successful delivery of complex construction projects. Facilities management, where you acquire the ability to organize, manage facilities and assets that could enhance producti productive use of those assets. And quantity surveying, where you, uh, which provides you with the skill sets to operate at senior roles within estimating departments and quantity surveying consultancies. We are bold to make claims on some of these five specializations. For example, our construction law specialization is the only specialist master's degree of that kind in New Zealand. And our facilities management specialization is being offered, um, it's, it's one of very few offered around the world. All of these can be studied one year full-time study it prepares you also for the Doctor of Philosophy, which is the highest qualification on offer within the School of Built Environment. Now, one concern often expressed by candidates when they are considering our program or considering New Zealand, if you are an international student, um, considering New Zealand as a destination is where, whether they can get jobs when they graduate. I can say with some confidence that your job prospects at a as a construction graduate in New Zealand is high. Even with the adverse impacts of the recent COVID-19, there are a number of initiatives to stimulate construction activity, which could consequently and positively restart the growth um, and national development that New Zealand so desires. Uh, New Zealand government is committing money towards what we call shovel ready projects, which are projects that are able to be started immediately, that can be completed within six months time frame. Also, the, across the length and breadth of New Zealand, these projects are being uh, projects have been identified, so they could be funded immediately. On top of this is government's investment of about 12 billion on programs to upgrade general infrastructure across the country and there are projects which and these projects as have a specific focus on cushioning the impact of COVID-19 on the construction industry. There are other ongoing projects in the area of housing as housing continues to be a challenge to New Zealand. Um, we have um, we have a platform through which job advertisements are frequently being posted to students to take advantage of some of these opportunities. In summary, I can say there's considerable growth in the construction sector, which translates into demand for our construction graduates. There's a wide range of opportunities. When you look through external online advertisement platforms like SIC, where you can find employment with consultancies, contractors, facilities management, research organizations, material manufacturing companies, oil and gas sector, to mention a few. As a graduate of our program, you are also not restricted to vertical construction, that is buildings, but you could also be involved in tra transport sector type projects where you'll be involved in the building of roads, bridges, and so on. So there are limitless opportunities. You only need to be enthusiastic, equip yourself well, and grab the opportunities as they come. It is not a surprise that our graduates are sought after. Our qualifications are internationally recognized and accredited by professional bodies. So we are recognized by the Chartered Institute of Building in the UK, the New Zealand Institute of Building here in New Zealand, and we are accredited by the Pacific Association of Quantity Surveyors, New Zealand Institute of Quantity Surveyors, and the Royal Chartered, um, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Now, these bodies scrutinize our curriculum yearly 
and also visit us regularly to ensure that our quality assurance processes are adequate. You may be interested in knowing how large the School of Built Environment is. We are, we have a community of about 623 Bachelor of Construction students, 92, 99 students on our taught postgrad postgraduate qualifications, the PGD and the Master of Construction. We have about 28 PhD students and it's growing. And at the moment, we have about 30 academic and technical staff who look after the program and help to facilitate your learning throughout your stay on our Upland campus. I would like to add that our delivery methods are innovative. They are largely student-centered to ensure your engagement of course contents so that you're able to take control of your own learning and progression through your program of study. We use methodologies such as flipped classroom, gamification, group assessments, that simulate the construction that simulates the construction real world and a lot of digital tools and techniques such as building information modeling virtual and augmented reality to stimulate your interest to become future captains of industries no two days will ever be the same as you seek best solution to real life problems if construction is industry is exciting it is fast paced and very importantly very rewarding. So I'd like to stop here so we can take, I can take whatever questions that you may have. I'm being assisted in this Q&A session by Dr. Wen Yi, our Associate Director of Postgraduate Studies, and Dr. Mustafa Jeloda, our Acting Director of Postgraduate Studies. Thank you for your attention. I'll take your questions now. Thank you, James. Uh... We do have a couple of questions uh, just around uh, the, uh, the practical components uh, of the program, as well as the high demand and how you guys have um, uh, adjusted some of the class times and schedules to um, kind of, um, you know, so, so that students who are working at the same time in the... Could you speak to us more about that, uh, James? Yes, uh, the student work experience paper, like I said, it's a, it's a requirement for 600 hours, but uh, this is broken down into two, usually um, uh, for uh, 300 hours each. So what happens is at the end of the first year, um, your first year on the program, you um, get a place where you, a placement, where you um, can then clock in the 300 hours that is required. Um, usually, you you know um, you need to take uh, you know typical of every practicum. You you make a note of the kind of things you are doing. Um, you 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 will be signed off on some of the skills that you have picked up, and also your workplace, uh, your employer would also sign off on the kind of skills that you have acquired during your time with them. So you have 300 hours usually at the end of the first year, another 300 hours at the end of the second year. And, and this has helped, like I said, um, our students to gain, um, you know, an entry into the, into the, um, to the job market. Uh, particularly for those who are international students, this is their opportunity to actually get to know the New Zealand work environment, uh, get to know some future employers, and, and and settle in well into the New Zealand work um, scene. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. And uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's great that you can come along to this introduction to Massey University's Bachelor of Science degree. Now, uh, my name is Murray Potter, as you, I've just been introduced. Uh, my background was one of being a, a child who had a insatiable first thirst for knowledge to understand how things work and the great thing about science is that it feeds that if you really want to be you know if you're fascinated about the world and want to understand it studying science is the pathway to do that as a career so in this brief talk i would like to give you a uh, overview of what we offer within this degree how the degree is structured and options available to you to personalize your degree and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to answer any questions you may have.
So what can you expect from a MS University Bachelor of Science degree? It offers flexibility and there's a combination within it that will expand on for both a focus on topics of your uh, true interest, but we have structured it to ensure that you get a breadth of information as well in areas beyond your own you know, very specific focus. There are many and varied career opportunities. I'm always blown away when I hear from our graduates as to what they are doing, what the uh, opportunities are. And uh, there's a very long list and it's, it, it truly is varied. And that is the wonderful thing about a Bachelor of Science. It opens up many doors, many doors that you're unaware of prior to doing this particular type of degree. Massey's Bachelor of Science degree is um, highly regarded internationally, and many of our graduates get employment in seriously diverse countries all around the globe. So let's think specifically about how this degree is structured. I say that it provides a flexible program that will challenge you, uh, it will give you lifelong and transferable skills, and that will come alongside the satisfaction of being involved in discovery. It provides you with solid integrated foundational knowledge in the sciences and a depth of knowledge in a major that you are especially interested in. Now, one of the nice things about Massey's BSc is that it has undergone a complete redesign and 2020 is the first year of us implementing that. And so you will be coming in and being able to enjoy the benefits of us having redesigned this degree, streamlined it, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll explain the structure that we've come up with that um, is considerably easier to navigate than we had uh, previously. And in fact, it's e easier to navigate than is offered by other universities. So the basic structure, structure is that each semester you take four courses. And of course you study for two semesters each year, so that's eight courses you will study each year. We've designed it so your first year of study will be in foundation courses that provide opportunities in a variety of majors in your second and third year. So you choose your major in your second year. The other part of this design is that your chosen major will offer um, half of the courses you need to do for your degree. And the other half, both in your second and third years, will come from other options. And so that's where the breadth of knowledge will come from. A nice feature of what we offer is that right from the outset, you can decide on a couple of majors that you're very interested in and that you'd like to take together. Or you can decide on something that interests you and do it as a minor and then add some other courses to that. So there's flexibility with how you actually set up and design your specific degree. First year keeps your options open, it really does. But then we offer you currently about 16 majors and there's lots of ways that you can mix and match those. You can do maths and microbiology, you can do environmental science and chemistry or zoology and ecology or physiology and statistics. So uh, a nice feature of the way we've structured the degree is this ability to mix and match different disciplines. <clears throat> we want your first year experience to be a fantastic one and we want it to set you up for lots of different options. So uh, there's some things that you will need to do in your first year. We have a course, Science and Sustainability. It's a brand new course this year and it provides foundation knowledge about what science is about and what we need to live in a sustain sustainable world. We recognize the need for mathematical skills within the BSc. So you will need to do a statistics course. You will need to do a maths course as well. 
some people come into the BSC via a pathway of considering, um, you know, perhaps a veterinary pathway. And <coughs> if you do that, uh, we do <coughs> set you up so that the course you'll do for the pre-vet studies uh, flows seamlessly into a Bachelor of Sciences. You then add to that other 100 level courses of your choice. And you choose those with assistance from a variety of people. We'll go through that in a moment. And that then helps you decide the pathway you go through your second and third year. <clears throat> Here's a quick guide to the 100 level courses we offer. And I've got a variety of sort of broad areas that uh, students often find attractive and um, the types of courses that you would take in your first year. You would add others to this mix. And the people who are supporting um, tonight's, um, you know, this information evening are there to help you build your course structure if you so wish, um, but we can, you know, you've got time to do that over the coming months. So there are courses that are required to facilitate different majoring options um, and um, this information is readily available on our website or through the various help options we will provide. The degree is structured around, um, well each degree at Massey has a academic dean and the academic dean for the uh, Bachelor of Sciences is Professor Tony Signal and uh, he has I've put his uh, email address here, a.i.signal a. A. at massey.ac.nz, and you're welcome to contact him if you have sort of high level uh, issues to deal with, with um, when you're thinking about how you structure a degree. Now, within the Bachelor of Sciences, each major has its own major leader, and <clears throat> each major is made up of courses, and each course has its own course coordinator. Our, team, our courses are mostly team taught and we have superb academics uh, within the College of Sciences who are passionate and knowledgeable and eager to pass their experience on to you. So there's a variety of ways you can get help. Obviously this evening is part of that, but uh, you can also uh, get general course advice online from course advice at massey.ac.nz. As you progress through your first year of study, you will like to seek advice about how your degree will develop beyond that point. Now the Massey University Contact Centre will continue to be able to provide you with academic advice about that, but you may also wish to talk to people who are working in the field that you uh, want to actually focus on. And so what we have are people who are major leaders for the various majors. And you are very welcome to contact any of the major leaders. They're all very approachable. Within the BSC, we have a variety of majors that are offered both in the Manawatu and at Albany, and some that are unique to a specific campus. So on the first slide here, we have the majors within the BSc that are available on the Manawatu campus. Those shown in blue, like chemistry or mathematics, physiology, zoology, are actually available both in the Manawatu and at Albany. The ones shown in green, uh, like earth science, uh, physics and statistics, all these ones here, they are available um, only on the Manawatu campus. These are the people you can contact uh, if you are up in Albany and interested in some of these majors. So again, it's the same principle. Those majors shown in blue are available on both campuses. Those shown in green are unique, in this case, to the Albany campus. So uh, take notes of these. I'll just flip back briefly to this one for Manawatu. If you're interested in any of these majors, take a quick note of the email address of the major leader and back to Albany. Same principle applies. 
If you're interested in any of these majors, please take a quick note of the major leader's email and we'll be more than happy to help you plan your uh, course of study with Mass University within the BSc. There's lots of support we provide people who come in to study at Massey and uh, many of these can be found very easily uh, online on the Massey uh, website because we know that people study degrees from you know with very different backgrounds and different challenges and so one thing that uh, I, mean, I actually did my degrees at a different university and I know from personal experience from working at Massey that we care enormously about students. We value you, we offer ways to help you navigate the complex challenges of getting into study and succeeding once you're there. We have uh, high quality interactive um, stream sites, these are set up in Moodle, and for each course you'll be able to be able to uh, follow uh, what is required of you, keep up to date, and uh, it's a, a really good interface um, that you will be, you know, uh, you'll be able to experience um, your study in a really helpful, um, supportive way. I'm just going to mention very briefly about laboratories being in the sciences. There are lots of practical components to what you will study and um, there's little things like, you know, you will require attending at labs and um, for distance study, we are quite inventive about how we handle that. And so um, we can provide detailed information about how you would get an equivalent experience in education if you need to study at distance. Okay, so what I'd like to finish on with this is that our degree uh, is a completely renovated, well structured. We're keen to be able to give you a fantastic education in the fields you like. <clears throat> we have something which offers flexibility. And when you go into university, you'll quickly discover that university life is very different from school in so many good ways. Uh, and um, we really want to offer you the support and help you succeed. Okay, thanks very much. And I'm open to any questions. Okay, thank you, Reti. So um, the Bachelor of Animal Science. So this is um, a new degree which started this year. Um, I've got the link there that you can use to access information. So I'm not going to repeat a huge amount of that, um, but I want to try and show you um, what we can um, deliver as an experience through the three years of the program. So if you click on that link, there is also um, YouTube clips that explain a lot more about what the program actually is. And um, uh, we've got a recent graduate, Martha, who um, who's, who's, uh, explains her experience of the program as well. All right, let's move things on. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's a brand new degree that started in 2020. It's a three year full time study. And the basic premise behind the program is to, to teach the scientific principles underlying healthy domestic animal function and behavior as well. So we have a number of core disciplines, um, nutrition, metabolism, so how animals work internally, reproduction, milk production, lactation, growth, genetics, welfare and behavior. And what we aim to do is give you a general grounding in these subject areas in your first year, and then you can select one of four majors as you go through your program into second and third year. So the program's integrated across species. Um, it takes you through all the different animal um, industries, both New Zealand and worldwide. And the program actually gives you um, access um, to jobs globally as well. In terms of entry requirements, um, so NCA level three is desirable, but not essential. So biology, chemistry and maths. First year and the summer school is designed to ensure that all students have this thorough, thorough grounding and it begins to introduce the animal science and production concepts that you'll carry on into more detail in second and third year. 
So you'll notice a few of these papers that are in common with the BSc programme. So the aim of this uh, first year is to, as I said, give you that grounding and you'll be doing these subjects alongside BSc students, but also veterinary science students as well. So the first semester is exactly the same as the Bachelor of Veterinary Science, so that if you don't get into vet, it's very seamless for you to carry on into the, the BSc programme or into the BNSI programme. So we show in the first year, you get the first indication of the animal behaviour and welfare material, the animals in environment paper that Murray talked about just previously, and you get that first introduction to animal science. And you also get the background that you need in the other sciences to allow you to progress and um, achieve success in the next years of the programme. There's also a science and sustainability paper that we've already mentioned. This one is specifically for agriculture and horticulture. So you'll be doing this alongside agriculture and horticulture students. So animal science then, it's a science-based area for both study and research. It's a key component of the agricultural industry. So it works alongside the agricultural industry. So the jobs that you will get at the end of the program relate to both agriculture, but also uh, companion animal and recreational animal as well. So we're looking at efficient, welfare-friendly, sustainable production practices, and this is the information that we'll be delivering through the three years of the program. So at the end of that first year, when you've had that thorough grounding, you can decide based on the material that you've been exposed to, what major you want to specialize in for the final two years of the program. So the first of these is animal breeding and genetics, then there's animal nutrition and growth, animal welfare and equine science. And in common with the BSc, there is options for you to use to do elective courses from either the other majors or from the BSc um, program. So this begins to show you the, the types of species that you'll be working with. Uh, the program is highly practical, um, we utilise a lot of the resources that Massey has. It's based in the Manawatu campus, uh, and so it can utilise all the farms around the university. So just to give you a flavour of the, the types of things that you'll be getting involved in and, and we use for our teaching. So we use uh, the on-farm um, experience. We also utilise the large animal teaching unit. Um, which is um, based very close by. So one of the huge advantages that Massey has down in the Manawatu is that it's surrounded by farms. Everything is really close by. And the majority of time you can almost walk to your practicals on these farms. So there's sheep farms, uh, we've got beef and dairy and poultry and even um, a cat and dog colony as well. So just to emphasize how close everything is, the campus is there on the centre right, and you can see where all of the farms and animal facilities are. So the large animal teaching unit, Latu, is the bottom right. We've got Keebles, which is a sheep farm, two dairy farms, pig unit, poultry unit, deer unit. There's a little bit of deer research involved in the program as well, and the close by canine and feline uh, facilities. So you'll get uh, full immersion into the um, animal facilities that Massey has. Career opportunities then. So you obviously want to know what uh, jobs you can get at the end of three years. So because this program is a global program, um, the Bachelor of Animal Science is, is taught in, in Europe as well as the US. So it's um, our graduates are world ready to walk into jobs globally. So there's jobs such as lab technicians, um, stock agents, on-farm technicians, animal welfare officers, feed, uh, animal feed companies. And that's a younger version of me um, from quite a long time ago when I was a zookeeper in London. So a huge variety of both domestic and exotic animals and also the Ministry of Primary Industries as well. A little bit more detail on the job front. Um, so these are the types of jobs that we've identified our graduates previously gone into. So there's a huge range there. Um, and this is, as I said, not just locally within New Zealand, but this is, is globally around the world as well. So if you would like to um, get more information uh, from this program or actually run through the individual videos, 
that I've suggested. Um, you can go to the Bachelor of Animal Science site. Uh, my contact details are here on this final slide, and I'm more than happy to answer any queries that you've got through the um, through the Glide Queer Q and A. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, just one question: um, Is it possible to double major under the Bachelor of Animal Science? Um, no, but you can still take, as I said, you can still take courses from outside the Bachelor of Animal Science to give you additional depth in areas such as zoology or ecology, or as I mentioned, the the other majors within the BNSI as well. So it gives you it gives you quite a nice um, opportunity to mix and match and get uh, some general animal um, depth to your degree. Awesome. And just um, around the equine, um, around uh, bringing your horse down, are there, are there any further details to that specifically? So yes, yeah, so one of the options, so as I mentioned there in the Massey um, plan there, the equine area allows you to keep your horse on campus so that you can ride between lectures. Um, there's, there's a grazing fee, and there's a dressage arena there, and there's also a cross country course um, for, for um, equine science uh, um, major students. And um, all the majors, uh, are they um, are, are there any differing kind of entry requirements that you covered, or are they just all the same stock standard uh, entry requirements? So the 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 plan for the the BSc is uh, for the the ANSI is that that first year gives you that grounding to allow you to to undertake each of the majors um, at an equal kind of level. So you've got all of that prior learning in the first year that. Um, that allows you to, to undertake each of the majors. So, and Sorry. just re relating to our next um, kind of speaker, just around the differences around the two programs, the Bachelor of Animal Science and the Bachelor of Vet Science, and what you would recommend for different students going, you know, thinking about either of those programs. Yeah, so you've, I mean, you can enter the, the VET program through this common first semester. So the pre-VET students who are aiming to get into the veterinary science program um, will complete the same four papers in that first semester as the Bachelor of Animal Science students. So the major difference between the two programs is that the Bachelor of Animal Science is concentrated on, on healthy animals and how we can maintain that health and improve efficiency of those animals, while the VET program is, is healing sick animals and preventing those animals getting sick in the first place in many cases. So the two programs are quite closely interlinked at the start and then the vet program um, separates off and they start to specialise more in the third and fourth year of their program. Lovely team. Well, if you are here for the vet session, if you have been to one of my sessions before, some of this might look a little familiar, but there's also going to be some new things. So once we are ready to go, um, what we'll do. So like I was saying, getting to think about why. So many people want to be a veterinarian because they, they just really want to help animals, which is a great starting place, but it's probably not quite enough in total. So other things we might want to think about is that it is actually a good lifestyle. You know, being a vet does help you make a contribution to society. Um, we're talking about a good standard of living. You're not going to be a millionaire being a vet, you know, things, at least I'm certainly not and most of my vet friends aren't, but it does mean that we have pretty good lifestyles. It also is really great because there's a huge broad range of careers and lots of different things. But I think it's really important that people have realistic expectations. So it's not all fluffy puppies and kittens. You know, sometimes it's dirty. Sometimes there's upset owners or farmers. Um, sometimes you're on call late at night when you'd rather be tucked up in your bed. And sometimes you're on your own when you wish there was other people with you. So it is a great career, but it's not all puppies and kittens. So the other thing I'd get you to think about really briefly is what kind of characteristics do you think make a good vet? Um, now, obviously, it's the kind of the, I guess, clear cut ones like mm, you want to like animals. But what I'd really like to impress upon you is that being a vet is actually a people job. 
um, you need to like working with people because there's no pets or farm animals that just rock up to see you by themselves. They're always in association with somebody and things. So being a vet is very much a people job and animals are the medium by which we work. So some other things that are quite helpful if you want to be a veterinarian, it is good to have a little bit of experience with animals, but we'll also make sure that you get quite a lot of that um, in the program. Um, it's also good to have a little bit of common sense um, and to have really good communication skills. So that's really key. You know, obviously, if we're going to be working with different people, um, the owners and things, we're working with lots of different people in our classes. We really need to be able to have good interpersonal skills and to be able to communicate well. There's another thing, too, that's quite helpful is being able to see different people's perspectives. Um, and things. So that's really important. Another thing is being able to kind of take in various different bits of information and being able to actually analyze it and reach conclusions. So it's not like math where there's right and wrong answers. There's often it's really you're putting together a lot of different things to be able to come up with um, decisions. So most people, what were their veterinary careers like? So most people, when they graduate from vet schools, they start out working in clinics. So they start out working, um, you know, sort of treating and caring for sick and injured animals, helping animals not become unwell in the first place, which is really important too. But a lot of people then end up in different fields of the veterinary profession. So there's so many different things we can do um, alongside clinical practice. So people work in zoos or SPCAs or people like me work at universities. Um, others work in industry and government. And in fact, the New Zealand government is one of the biggest employers of veterinarians in New Zealand. And the really cool thing about a vet degree from Massey is that you can work almost all over the world. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So I guess the biggest thing is, is if you're thinking about coming to vet school is that you really need to be prepared. There is a competition phase, which we'll talk about, and so you want to give yourself the best chance of success. So being prepared means that if you're doing NCAA, you really want to be focusing on the maths and science. Now, I would also kind of say to the more external credits you can do, the better practice that is for actually coming to Massey, sitting lots of big final exams and things. So really use your high school time to actually challenge yourself and get ready. So we are generally kind of talk about for NCA level three, we would like, um, like you've done chem and bio and NCA level three, that's going to be really helpful to you. Math and physics, ideally level three, but if not, then at least some in level two would be great too. And obviously you're going to need to do English as well. One for uni entrance, but also because it's really important to being able to communicate well and um, interacting well with people. So chem, bio, math, those are your big ones. Physics ideally to at least NCA level two. Now, if you're kind of sitting there going, oh man, I totally haven't done these courses, then don't fear, there's things that you can do, but what I'd say is take the time to prepare. Don't just come and kind of go, oh, I'll hope it'll be okay and I'll work hard because everybody's working hard. And some of those other people who are working really hard have also actually done NCA level three math and chem and bio and phys. So it's not just about working hard, it's about coming prepared. So if you haven't done some of those things right now, what you might want to think about is instead of coming straight to pre-vet or the vet pre-selection semester, you might want to think about doing something like a foundation program or one of the certificates in science and tech just to get ready so that when you come to hit that starting line of the vet pre-selection semester, you're in your best place for success. If you haven't done those things, or if, let me rephrase that, if you've done lots of NCAA uh, science and math already to at least level two and ideally level three, then this isn't necessarily the step for you. You might be just ready to come straight ahead to the vet school. If you're unsure, talk to one of our amazing advisors. They can absolutely help um, you figure out where you're at, where you need to be, and if you're ready to get going. So if we talk about the veterinary degree, so it's called a Bachelor of Veterinary Science. and one of the cool things is that it met in New Zealand, Massey is the sole provider of veterinary education. So we are the pathway to becoming a veterinarian. Um, cool things as well too, is that it's well ranked in the world. So it's well ranked by employers. It's also the vet school itself is well ranked over the world. And now as Kiwis, we go 29th in the world. Pah, that's not that great. Well, just to give you some context on that, Italy alone has 200 vet schools. So actually being in the top 50 of vet schools in the world is pretty awesome. Another really important thing to know is that we're really highly accredited. So by the American and Canadian Veterinary Medical Associations, also by the UK and throughout Australia and New Zealand. So like I said before, it means that once you graduate from us, there's lots of different places that you can work in the world. 
The degree itself is five years. So that's broken up into a pre-selection semester, which is um, when you first come to uni, and then what we call the professional phase, which is four and a half years. Now getting into pre-selection, there's, there's no limit on the number of places and you need to have uni entrance to do that. But being able to progress to the professional phase, there's definitely a limited number of places. So we do select very much. So it is a little bit of a competition. When we think about the professional phase, um, once you get into vet school, it's the professional phase is what I'd call like vet school proper. And once you get in there, we sort of start off by teaching you like the normal things, the way that anatomy and normal anatomy and physiology, how things work, what the body's like, and then also like normal farming practices and things like that. Then we sort of progress to where things go wrong or the abnormal. So then we talk about things like pathology, which is diseases and microbiology, which is all the different bugs that can cause lots of different diseases. And then we progress to trying to fix it because right if we know what normal looks like and we can recognize when it's gone bad well, what we want to do is be able to get things back to proper function and return to normal so that's where we talk about things like medicine and surgery and pharmacology which is about the different medications or drugs that you can give to help animals return to normal so that's sort of the i guess the veterinary content but really important alongside that and running throughout the degree is our professional studies programs. So uh, there's a course called SPINE, which is where you take the content you're learning in your other classes and apply it to questions and problems and cases to actually make sure that you're understanding it in the context of what a veterinarian does. We also um, have professional studies courses where we focus on things like communication and interpersonal skills, because these are all those things we were saying are really important to being successful. Another real focus we have too is on developing your personal well-being. So lots of us have struggles in life, that's just kind of normal, but in vet school it is pretty stressful and what we want to do is help support you guys to develop the strategies and uh, ways to actually be able to maintain well-being while you're in vet school so that when you go out into the working world that you've actually got those strategies in place. So being able to look after ourselves is really important because if we're not looking after ourselves then how can we actually expect to look after clients and their animals? So another thing that's really important is what we call selection. So as I said, when you come, you'll go undergo the pre-selection phase, which is kind of open entry. You've got to have uni entrance. And then we're going to select you down to a much smaller number that, that progress into the professional phase. So a key thing you need to know is about the different applications because it's actually have got multiple applications to be able to get into vet school. It's almost, I guess, like the first step to kind of get, figuring out whether people have got what it takes. So the very first step is you'll jump onto the Massey website and you'll apply for admission to the BVSC pre-selection phase. Now this is, uh, you can do it any time, um, you know, up until sort of early February with uni starting in February each year. But the sooner you do it, the better, because it'll give you much more time to know what you're doing, to get prepared, to plan. Then there's a second application. So then you have to put in your application for selection into the professional phase. And that's due by March 5th. And it's also an online application on the Massey website. Now the last application is what's called our veterinary supplementary application. So everybody who applies to um, the second stage, so that second application, selection into the professional phase, we then send them a link to the supplementary application and it's got a pretty quick turnaround. So it's really only a few days. It doesn't take long, but they need to jump on there and actually get that submitted. And we're pretty big on deadlines in the vet school. So um, we do need you to hit those deadlines if you want to be selected. People often ask, you know, how many, what sort of numbers are there? So we select 124 students into the class, which is made up of 100 domestic students and uh, 24 international students. And so if we just have a look at this slide here, what it tells us is kind of the number of people that are applying uh, more recently. So this is 2019. And so we can see that for 100 domestic places, that there was actually 330 people applying for those places. Okay, so initially at the start of the semester, 330 people going for 100 places, you know, it's roughly one in three you're going to get in, pretty close to. But then at the end of the semester, then we can look at what we call the eligible applicants. So there's different eligibility criteria that you have to meet in order to progress on to the professional phase or to be eligible for selection to the professional phase. Now at the end of that semester, last year of that 330, about 200 actually had met the, the eligibility criteria. 
So then all of a sudden you've got 200 people competing for 100 places. So actually one in every two people will get in. So there's often this thing, uh, people sometimes like to say that, oh, it's harder to get into vet school than med school. But in the end, if you meet eligibility, then you've got a 50% chance, basically. And so that's actually um, quite good in comparison to med school. If we look at our, what we call our Group 1 international students, these are our students who are not domestic residents, so they're not New Zealand uh, residents or citizens, or not Australian residents or citizens. So if you don't have Australian, New Zealand residents or citizenship, then you'd come under what we call the international category, and you'd come here and uh, in very much the same way that our domestic students would apply for selection into the professional phase. So if those students, um, in 2019 we had about 20 places available for them and at the beginning of the semester there was 49 people so it was roughly you know a 33 percent chance of selection again similar. At the end of that semester there was 25 people who'd actually met eligibility so all of a sudden it was like an 80 percent chance of selection. So it does depend on the pool that you're in, uh, whether you're domestic or uh, international, as to how many people we've, how many places we've got, and also what those chances of selection are. Generally speaking, we encourage people to aim for kind of at least a B plus average to give themselves a good chance, um, and then to do well on their non-academic assessments, which I'm going to talk about as well. So. When we have students, they come into that pre-selection phase and then there's two pathways that they can, one of two pathways that they can apply for selection into the professional phase. So the first is what we call the general pathway and the second is what we call the vet map pathway. Now to be, um, for the general pathway you need to be a domestic or a group one international student, but for those students who are Māori or Indigenous Pacific, they also have the option of applying through the vet map pathway. And We'll talk a little bit about that. So for the general pathway, what we have is the students go into what's called stage one. They will sit the a CASPER assessment and a STAT F test. And if in your head you're going, what is CASPER and STAT F? Don't worry, I'll tell you a little bit later on. So they just sit the, the CASPER and the STAT F, and we'd use the scores from that to shortlist them for the interview stage, which is stage two. And stage two, they'd sit the interview, which is a multiple mini interview. We'd also use their grades, and then we'd we would select them on the basis of their grades and their MMI. The vet map pathway, um, I should just note that there's an extra application for this. Um, the deadline for that is usually about February 1st and it will be confirmed on the web page and the application also comes from the web page as well. So with the same selection assessments, we've got the GPA, STAT F, CASPER and the MMI, um, but this is all in a single stage rather than in a two stage process. In order to apply for VetMap, as I mentioned, you need to be either Māori or Indigenous Pacific. Um, and there's also a few different extra activities that you're going to have to engage in through this pathway as well too. A really important thing to be aware of is that there is a limitation on the number of applications. So in the past, you used to be able to apply for vet school as many times as you like. Um, now there is a maximum of three application attempts for the professional phase. So it's just something to be aware of. The other thing I would just note too is that everything I'm saying tonight is all on our BVSC planning page. I'll show you how to navigate there in a little bit as well, just to make sure. So if you do need to find out more info or you want to recheck any of these things that I've said, they are all on the website. So as I mentioned, we have minimum eligibility criteria and these apply irrespective of what pathway you apply to. The first thing is you have to have done a certain amount of uh, veterinary practical work in a veterinary clinic. You have to pass what we call our prerequisite classes. You need to get a minimum of a B average in your courses, so a GPA of a five. And you need to collect, complete the, uh, the CASPER test, the, MM, uh, the MMI, um, and the STAT F. So you need to complete those selection assessments that are specific to the pathway. So if we think about work experience, the one thing I really want to highlight here. So the purpose of this is for, to help people see behind the scenes of a vet clinic because it's different behind the door compared to what we see as clients if we take animals in. So we like people to do at least 10 days and by 10 days we mean like full eight hour days sort of thing. So 80 hours altogether. Uh, needs to be within the last three years. And if you can, it's great if you can see one week of small animal practice and one week of large just to give you a better idea about what veterinary practice is like. It does need to get signed off by a veterinarian on the proper form, which you can also get from the web page. The biggest thing I would like you to remember about your vet work experience is that you need to complete this before you come to the pre-selection semester. There isn't time to do it after then, so you will find yourself ineligible, and that's always a bit gutting for everybody. 
that you've come in, you've put in the effort of the classes, but then because you haven't actually dealt with this already, that you might end up being ineligible. So please, please, please get your work experience done. Now, obviously COVID has thrown things into a little bit of disarray this year. We are still maintaining this, but watch our web page because depending on what happens with the different COVID response levels uh, will influence whether people can actually get this prac work done. We're in level two now. I'm assuming we're hoping that things will keep progressing well and that we should get back to levels that would allow you to get back into doing vet work experience. The prerequisite classes, so there's uh, two biology based classes, so cell biology and animals in their environments. So there's also a chemistry class and then biophysical principles, which is a combination math and physics class. You need to pass these classes. So even if you get an A plus in three of them and just don't pass one, you know, barely fail one of them, it does mean you're ineligible. So you do need to pass all these prerequisite classes when you come and take them at the university. Calculate something for you called a GPA or a grade point average. And it's just a way that we take the grades that you get in your classes and we turn it into a number out of nine. And it gives us an, uh, an, a way to understand your overall academic performance. So, generally speaking, you need to have a GPA of five or a B. You know, so even if you're 4.98, unfortunately, that's not a five thing. So, you need to have at least a B average or the equivalent of a five in your GPA. The other assessment, uh, the other academic assessment you do is something called the STAT F test. Um, it's a two hour multiple choice test that's designed to assess your uh, critical thinking and problem solving using written and um, numerical material. So you might, um, it's quite time, it's quite pacey. It's one of those things that just it tests your general accumulation of knowledge rather than it's something, it's not really something you can specifically um, study for. And then when people apply, we do provide them links to practice tests uh, for these types of things. So CASPER is, another, is now one of our non-academic assessments, and it's an online tool that we use where people watch video scenarios, and then they'll have five minutes to answer, type in uh, three, their response to three open-ended questions. So this one is cool because it's online, so this, <laughs> we've still been able to do this with COVID um, and things. So. It's one of the other assessments and the big one is the interview and this seems to be the one that people have the most questions about or are the most nervous about. Um, we don't interview everybody so there is a shortlisting process as mentioned uh, we shortlist on the basis of uh, the CASPER score and the STAT F test score. Now the MMI weekend happens in Palmerston North. The dates for 2021 haven't been set yet but you should anticipate it'll probably be in mid or late mid to late May. Um, so students who are based anywhere else in the country will need to come to Palmerston North that weekend and they will need to arrange and organize their travel and their accommodation and also to pay for that. So just being aware the MMI is only in Palmerston North. And what the MMI is, is that it's, been, it's actually been referred to as like interview speed dating. So what happens is that as a candidate, they'll come and they'll interact with eight different interviewers at eight different stations. And the reason why we do more than one interview is it gives us a more reliable measure of people's um, abilities. So as you can see in this little picture here, there'll be eight different interviewers behind eight different doors and you'll just rotate through all the different, um, all the different interview stations. Now at each station, what you do is it's not like an interview that you'd more normally go where they go, why do you want to go to vet school? It's one where you go there and you read a specific scenario for each station. So every station has its own scenario and then you'll have some questions about that scenario. And then what you'll do is you'll have time to sit outside to read the scenario, to prepare your thoughts, and then you'll go into the room and actually discuss that scenario with the interviewer in the room for up to six minutes. So that's why I kind of sort of like interview speeding because you go to different doors and you'll talk to lots of different people. Another key thing um, is that we actually I've done quite well for time. So another key thing here is um, the dates for 2021. So like I said, deadlines are quite important. If you're planning on coming onto campus, I've put that the accommodation application is due on the 1st of October. You really want to get it in by mid-September actually because by the 1st of October they're going to start sending out the first round of accommodation offers. So if you want to get your choice of accommodation, you really need to have your offer in before then. Um, if you're applying for the VetMet pathway, you'd need to have that application in by the 1st of February. And then on the 22nd of February next year is when semester one will start and when it will all kick off. Um, 
as we mentioned, the 5th of March is when the when your application for the professional phase is due. And it's, that's a really key date. I probably can't stress that one quite enough. If you miss the 5th of March application, then everything is over um, and you won't be getting into vet school that year. And then around about the 10th of March, but to be confirmed is when people have to submit their veterinary supplementary application. So I wanted to just spend a minute just talking about the actual where you can find more information because there is a lot. Um, there's a lot to know about the veterinary program and about how to actually get in and um, it's always a little bit sad to see when people haven't actually understood the process or read the information and so miss out purely by um, logistics and details, not because they're actually not qualified. So we have something called the BVSC planning page. And you can go to it by going onto the main Massey website. And then if you search BVSC planning, the first hit that comes up will be this one. It says the Bachelor of Veterinary Science, and that's the one that you want to click on. Now, when you click on there, it actually, um, what we can see from this picture is you actually be on what we call the info tab. And where I've got that big pink arrow is you need to click on the planning tab because that's the page that actually shows all of the information about um, applying for the program, getting into the pro getting into the professional phase and things. So I would really, really strongly encourage you to read this web page very thoroughly. The other thing that people often want to do is come and take a tour um, of the vet school. Now, because we have patients in there because of biosecurity reasons and privacy and things, we can't actually just tour people through the vet school. So we've set up some virtual vet tours that you can uh, look at. There's about nine different videos and it's done um, in different parts of the vet school and different parts of the vet clinics and it's narrated or fronted by um, veterinary students at the time. So same thing if you go back to that Massey web page, if you search vet school, uh, click on the first hit which will be veterinary programs and then on the page in the banner which is the, the colored area at the top of the page it will say behind the scenes and you can take the tour. Now one thing to be aware of is that there are three different where I've got the smaller pink arrow there's three different banners and they rotate so you need to make sure that that little first orange that little first circle is yellow because then, then you're actually on the vet tour one. If you can't see it right away it may be just that the banner needs to circle back again. So take a look through the vet tour the virtual vet tour is really helpful it helps you to see what the vet school is actually like and to hear from veterinary students about what they actually do. So team, thanks so much for your um, things. This has been a bit of a whirlwind. I got to admit, I usually do this presentation over a slightly longer time period, um, but so grateful for you joining us tonight and yeah, just really looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Eloise. Uh, there are a few questions. Um, you talked briefly about VetMap. Uh, are there any Maori scholarships uh, for any vet students? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thanks, Riti. Um, so there are, at the moment, there's not one specifically for Maori students. Um, there's quite a lot of scholarships that you can apply for once you're actually into the veterinary program, but not as much that you can apply for when you're actually trying to get in. So when you're the vet pre-selection phase, not a lot of scholarships there, but once you actually get in, and they're not really specific to, there's some that are specific for New Zealanders um, and things, but at the moment, there's not a significant number that actually specifically for Maori. Cool. Our next question uh, is, could you speak to the differences between vet science and vet nursing? Um. Absolutely. Um, so we offer veterinary science and we uh, are also offering the veterinary technology program. We're just not taking new enrollments on that one at the moment. And then there's vet nursing. So vet nursing is what um, you can imagine it's like the nurse in a hospital and things. So they do lots of things to support the work of the veterinarian. But in New Zealand, if you actually want to work as a veterinarian, you do have to have a Bachelor of Veterinary Science degree. Um, so if you want to do things like surgery and actually make diagnoses and things like that, then it is a veterinary science degree. The veterinary technology degree was sort of an intermediate. Um, so it was um, I, while they could do vet nursing things, they could also do some things that veterinarians could do. But again, as I mentioned, that we're not currently taking enrollments for that at the moment. Um, so Veterinary science is the only way to actually become a veterinarian, which does give you, I guess, a much broader range of um, work opportunities and things than we would traditionally have as a vet nurse. 
Cool. Couple more questions, Eloise, that you, uh, if you could please answer live. Um, just around the 80 hours for um, entry requirements. Uh, firstly, is there any advice around getting those um, those practical? Um, oh, sorry, those um, those done. Yeah. So it's uh, just it setting was, them up. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. The first thing is is just front up front up to a clinic and just say, hey, I'm really interested. I'm looking at going to vet school. I need to do these hours. Veterinary clinics in New Zealand are very familiar with this requirement and there are very, very few that don't take students for this. So I would literally just hop in there, you know, maybe don't go in your Scotius jeans, maybe look slightly tidy when you're going in and introduce yourself and say, I'm looking to do some prep work. Can I book in here for a week or two? And honestly, most clinics are amazingly um, supportive and willing to support students who are trying to come and join the veterinary profession. As I said, currently with COVID, it's a little bit different because obviously there's all sorts of distancing requirements and things. So there's a lot of clinics that are not taking students at this very moment, but I'm desperately hopeful that towards we get towards the latter part of the year into the summer holidays that they should all be back up and uh, up and doing that again. Cool. Um, another question is around physics. Um, so obviously this is for our high school leavers. Um, is phys physics necessary for students coming out of high school? Yeah, so it's a good question and things have changed a little bit. So our physics course um, as of this year, as of 2020, we've actually changed it so that it is um, a little bit more uh, introductory than it used to be. So it used to be at a relatively high level and without NCA level three, it was incredibly difficult to actually pass that physics course in the past. Uh, now the biophysical principles class, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's it's more introductory. It's more based on principles. Um, it would be still be highly recommended to have done at least NCA level two math and ideally physics because it will just set you up better for that. You can come without a physics background from high school, but it does mean that you're just going to be playing a little bit of catch up and remembering that you're competing for those places in the professional phase with the other people in your courses. And so you want to give yourself the best chance of success. Cool, thank you. We've just had a few more jump in. So um, could you please um, share a little bit more about uh, job opportunities or um, what it looks like for a, a vet doctor? Sure, absolutely. So we have really high employment rates. So within, we usually do a six month survey of our graduates and generally by about six months, 95% of them are working in either full or part-time employment. Um, and so job prospects are excellent. Most people do start out working in a clinic, so either as a small or large animal veterinarian, um, you know, treating animals, helping them get well, helping them ideally prevent them from becoming unwell in the first place, doing surgery, seeing patients and clients. That's where most people start out. And I would say most people stay in clinical practice for at least two years. Now, there's some people who would do clinical practice for their whole lives. It's perfect for them. They're totally, you know, it's their dream job. There's other people that will end up migrating to some slightly different Different areas. So we can stay in what I'd call like GP clinical practice. Uh, people can go and specialize. They can become cardiologists or uh, endocrinologists or surgeons or pathologists. Much like the human world, we can just go and specialize in different areas of the veterinary medical world. Then there's other people like myself who come back and actually work at university. There's people who work purely in research. Uh, we've got Nobel Prize winners that were veterinarians and things. So it's actually there's a huge amount of opportunity to do like a really broad range of things in addition to clinical practice. Hi Louise, uh, last last two. Um, will the 80 hours, so going back to the 80 hours, will it be reduced due to COVID? And the second part was, is there any advantage to doing more than 80 hours in your practical? Excellent. So at the moment we're holding on the 80 hour requirement because we believe that basically it's a couple, you know, it's a couple of weeks and as long as things return to normal, then we will still be anticipating the 80 hour requirement. We will review this, you know, and things. So as time goes, if, if COVID is proving more problematic, if we have second wave or things like that, it may be that we need to reduce that in the future, but currently it will be staying at the 80 hours. If you want to recheck where we're at with that, check the website because that's where we'll post it um, on that BVSC planning page that I mentioned. If it does change, that's where it will be. The other question was, is there any advantage to doing more time? It's really actually 
for you, the more time you can spend, it might be better for your development and knowing, is this definitely the right thing for me? In terms of your chances of selection into the veterinary school, it won't actually impact on that. For us, it's a we tick that you've met that time because it's our minimum requirement. Um, you're ready to publish my. But if you do more, then you don't. It doesn't make a difference to selection, but it may make a difference to you and your understanding of, is this the right profession for me? Lovely. I think that's about all of our time there. Thank you so much, everybody. If you have any questions, you can email us, uh, email the advice team, and they will be happy to help you out.